go out there and listen to people. That's all I got to say. Listen, be curious, and maybe we could change the world that way. Like, I was wondering, would I feel touched by it? Um, being as I've watched it three times today or four times, I still do. There's something in hearing people's stories uh, that really gets me. And a few things really stood out for me. I think the sense of connection and acceptance and the sense that our he own healing can be bound up in other people's healing. That really resonates for me. But um, I guess because we've had some new people join us again, before we get into the meat of this discussion, I'm wondering if it'd be good just to quickly go around again and introduce ourselves so the people who've just tuned in know who we are. Um, and then I'll briefly explain what we're going to do next, and then we'll hear about your reflections from it. Okay, so I guess I'm going to do the same order before, if that's all right. So Jess, if you'd go first. Oh, hi everyone. Um, so my name's Jess. Um, I came to the Hearing Voices Network um, when I was a young teenager. Um, I was kind of supported by somebody who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, um, who um, was chair of a, of, a ch of a charity in Manchester. Um, and so, yeah, my brother was diagnosed with schizophrenia when I was um, 14 and as a family, we just found it really hard to deal with. I also have my own mental health problems um, to a kind of, that weren't diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my entry and I found it kind of really helpful and I kind of managed to escape psychiatry mostly. Um, and then when I started working, I went on some Hearing Voices Network training and um, started working with people using that approach um, in 2017, I came and worked for Minding Camden um, in London and I started working on their prison project and I'm now managing the three Hearing Voices projects at Minding Camden. So that's Voice Collective, Voice Unlocked and the London Hearing Voices Network. Um, and I'm also coming to the end of my training as an integrative psychotherapist. Um, so I would say that the Hearing Voices Network has very much influenced the way that I now practice as a therapist. Um, yeah, that's me. Hello again, uh, my name's Owen. Uh, I'm an artist from South East London. Uh, I'm also a member of the Board of Trustees uh, for HVN. Um, I've been involved with the charity as well as like the broader kind of like uh, hearing voices kind of movement since I was a teenager, I suppose, basically. And um, uh, uh, I am also a voice hearer, which is why I was involved for such a long period of time as well. Um, it was uh, it was just it was really lovely to watch that, by the way. I was just really, I was a little bit moved as well, right? It was really gorgeous. So, um, yeah, um, I don't really have as many impressive uh, CV creds to say as Jess, but... Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Owen, and thank you both so much for the feedback. I'm Caroline Muzzle Carlton. Um, you, you saw a little bit um, about me in, in the film, including my cat Sprincy. I really fought for that cat credit. Um, that felt important to me as we were editing the film. Um, I'm a voice here, um, first and foremost. My voices are still in my life. Um, you know, I have so much more community around that now, but I would be lying to say they didn't challenge me sometimes, um, but they also inspire me as well. Um, my CV is, I'm the director of training of the Western Mass 
recovery learning community and also the hearing voices research and development project so um, i get to travel to different parts of the us um, and connect with people who are interested in creating these types of supportive uh, communities right in their state um, i am on the board of hvn um, usa um, and one of the things my voices have also led me to do is that I'm studying to become a rabbi. Um, and, you know, Jess was talking about how her experience in HBN has like led her on a path. Um, you know, being able to hold many different perspectives um, and honor that and all my experience being in rooms where people have all these unique experiences, but they still build community around shared values. That's really helpful for spiritual communities too. So I'm loving being able to bring everything I'm learning um, and making more room for cultural and spiritual perspectives of voices um, is a passion of mine. Uh, so that's me. Wow, thanks, Caroline. And hi, everybody. Again, I'm Tessine. Um, it's a real uh, uh, honor and a pleasure to be invited to, to take part. I am. Um, I went to a, a Hearing Voices Network meeting in 2005, I think it was, in Manchester, um, uh, as a as a researcher, and um, was completely overwhelmed by and, and and blown away by the sort of story, the power of the storytelling. Um, of people just telling their stories. And so still that really comes through in this uh, wonderful documentary. Um, I, I, I did a PhD um, in sociology in Bristol in England um, uh, that ended in 2012, which was primarily looking at the Hearing Voices Network and uh, working with and uh, researching the, the group in Bristol. Um, and uh, it was kind of about how uh, the Hearing Voices Network, largely about how the Hearing Voices Network produces so many different kinds of knowledge and power that then can contest biomedical framings of sort of the same phenomena. Um, so that was that. And then since then I moved uh, to more looking at psychedelic experiences. I sort of fell into that, but um, first working with a, with a team that was using psychedelics in a kind of therapeutic way. And now I, I, I broaden that out and I'm writing a book, which is at the intersections of psychedelic experiences and ex so-called sort of psychotic or um, mad experiences, depending on one's framing or, um, and, and the, the, the kind of intersections in the, the the nature of the experiences, how we can work upon them, um, and the politics of them, and and how they um, can inform one another. But really happy to be here. Hi all, my name is Mia. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner, um, psychotherapy trainer from Finland. I've been working there in mental health services about 19 years. I don't have experiences, uh, at least yet, about hearing voices, but I have been in, in the same room um, with people and their networks trying to figure out how to be in those moments of possible crises and difficult times in their lives. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for having me. And just to say about the, the work as a trainer, one of my passionate is about um, inviting people who work in these different settings in systems to explore their own family narratives and their own um, yes experiences because we always bring to our everything into the work we do and into the being with yeah that's certainly my experience mia it's interesting how both, um, I think everyone has actually said a little bit about how their life <laughs> has brought them to this point. Um, briefly, I'm Ray, for those that don't know, the chair of HVN in England. Um, I have voices, visions, unusual ideas and beliefs, history of all kinds. My CV of psychiatric history, like some other people here, is quite impressive. Um, currently diagnosed with schizophrenia. Ooh. I got rid of it for a decade and then it came back on my notes. Um, 
had a baby. It's a long story. But basically living with my experiences as we all live with our stuff. Um, and I have that multitasking amazingness that I think Caroline meant, uh, mentioned, that there's actually lots of different things going on in my life. And I think that's because I have so many voices. Anyway, so what we're going to do today is obviously give this panel a little time to chat together in this slightly awkward, weird way. And they'll find their vibe because Zoom is a challenge for us all. Um, and as you listen to them, you can type some reflections in the chats, you know, if you want to comment on anything, you can ask a question so you can get the Q&A bit. 11 questions have been asked thus far, so well done. Keep asking. We're not going to answer them directly yet. The last sort of section will have a good sort of 20, 30 minutes to those questions. And all those questions will be taken from the Q&A box. All those of you that have put your hand up, we've got two at the moment, we'll also invite you guys into the room to ask your question in person, either just by audio or with video. That's enough from me. I guess I'll just ask a starter question and shut up. Um, just sitting here now, what's really sticking with you, resonating with you about that, that film? What's, what's with you? Um, well, I think it's something that actually you also just mentioned a minute ago to see, which is something that I've always got. I, just, I never get tired of it either, but it's very remarkable that story to, um, voice hearers have a real remarkable kind of capacity for storytelling, raconteurship, and like an ability, a beautiful ability to like describe things I've seen. It might be a coincidence or it might be a pattern. I don't know. I've just noticed that it seems like voice hearers describe stuff, including their own experiences in the world around them, in a way that's really quite, um, I, I find it really lovely to listen to anyway, firstly. Uh, and I suppose that on hearing, sorry, sorry, hearing people talk about their experiences is always gorgeous. And on top of that, hearing people talk about their experience of uh, the groups specifically was wonderful, like um, specifically, one older gentleman um, saying how much it had affected him and saying how it haunted him that he didn't have those when he was younger. I was like, oh, that's, that really like got me. And I've heard other old older voice hearers say um, similar things as well. And it really kind of um, landed with me, I suppose. Um, yeah. If anyone else has anything else they want to say along those lines or something else completely differently, please go, go crazy on that. <laughs> it definitely kind of fills me with a really warm kind of feeling of connectedness and community. Um, I'm, I'm not a voice hearer, but I kind of feel like an honorary kind of member of the community. Well, I do feel like a member of the community and it's just, yeah, it's, um, it's a really special community to be part of and I've met some of the people in the video but not all of them but I don't know it left me feeling like I'd love to, I'd love to meet them and hear their stories more and yeah just what they've got to say is really really valuable yeah that's, that's where it left me really I yeah, that, completely. I um, my my set my my strong thing coming away from it is it's about the it, it really is about how how moved I feel. You know, I feel so different when I hear when, when I hear such powerful stories of people's transformation, um, and and often for the better and in a, uh, or always for the better in the documentary, but in a kind of enlargement of life. It's so much. The talk about meaningfulness is so important, the meaningfulness of the voices and the experiences, but there's so much more to the to the groups than that in terms of community and 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 connection. So yeah, I uh, that, that that what one thing it made me think about, which I I never really figured out, but uh, it's a kind of riddle that sticks with me that I'd, I'd love to just bring up is is that um a facilitator of uh, uh, the Bristol Hearing Voices Group once said to me a while ago that uh, what he finds really profound at the core of it, and I don't know if this resonates, Caroline, because it's um, he was a, a Christian guy and it's kind of his spirituality was very much informing things, but he was saying that 
it's, it's, a, it's a really tight co-emergence of truth and trust. And he saw truth and trust as really kind of tightly woven together. Um, and that always stuck with me as really kind of generative. Sure, when you, when you trust people, you, you can see the truth of what they're saying. Or when, when someone says something really true, then you kind of come to, to trust them. But, but when you trust people, isn't that what community is? And so it's a kind of knowing, it's maybe a, a kind of being together beyond knowing. I don't know. I, I love the generativity of those two. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really touched by what he said about truth and trust, because in making this film, there were moments where we were like, can we trust people enough to tell the truth? So there were a couple things that almost didn't make it into the movie because we had just hours and hours of interviews and footage. And I was really touched by what Owen said about Barry's comment because we almost didn't include it because it's sad. It's, it's regretful. You know, Barry's an amazing man. He's brought up amazing daughters. Um, he does so much with his life, but he's a man that has regrets. And I think a lot of us do. Um, another comment that almost didn't make it was my my talking about voices that tell me to kill myself. People were like, can we trust people to hold this truth? Um, can't, does it belong in the 22 minute film? And we decided that we did, that it did. It did belong there. Um, because for me as an HVN facilitator and, you know, participant, it's, you know, sometimes it's dark, like some life can be really effing hard. Um, and the, the difference is just that we don't have to be alone in it and we don't have to wear a mask and we can tell the truth and still be accepted. Um, and so I totally, I totally hear that. And it was something that we, considered and we're like you know what we're gonna leave we're gonna leave that stuff in because it's true um it's important and maybe it'll liberate other people to express things that might be on the darker side um make sure that our communities can hold people in their wholeness that was very um very strong uh, sentence for me, Carol. You said about that, can we trust people to hold the truth? Can you say more about that? Well, kind of, what is it for you? Or? So as an American, I live in a culture where, you know, there's ads on TV that pathologize me, that center my problems within me. There's regular media reports blaming like violence in our culture, not on our totally lax gun laws, but on people like myself who have psychiatric diagnoses. And so there was this tension because it's like, we wanted to show that voice hearers are parents and veterans, there's a veteran in the film, though that isn't named, uh, students, uh, that they come from many walks of life. Um, we wanted to introduce the American public to voice hears, but we also didn't want it to be this like super shiny packaged, you know, one note narrative either. Um, so we wanted to, we had to have trust in making this that people could hold some of the complexities. But thank you for that question. Yes, thank you. And that was related to the thing that, that really struck me when I was uh, watching and listening to the film, that there was this woman who was, I don't remember the exact words, but she was saying something that, um, she has been uh, in silence with her voices for decades and now she's speaking out. And I was thinking that how would it be to live my life of, of being silent about me 
or of my voices. Even I don't have the external voices, but so that was very powerful as well. And then I, I have been thinking about this, all these almost 19 years when I have been working in systems that, um, that we have us humans and, and we have experiences and we need the connectedness that Jessica, you were talking about as well. And how we humans, we have been building these institutions and systems where people are listening and responding. And I'm thinking that what kind of systems are we building? And you have been building a system uh, in this Hearing Voices Network. So I'm, I'm wondering that, how is this as a system? I don't know, there isn't even a question here. I'm just thinking out loud. I dare to do that here. Mm. Yeah, but I was thinking about that. But I was thinking mostly that how would it be to live my life in silence with what I am or who I am? Yeah. Um, it's uh, something else that I've, uh, this also struck me as being recurrent through lots of some of the things that some of the people in the film were saying and other stuff I've heard from other voice hearers, or a slightly like sadder note, I suppose, is like a recurrent fear and uh, fear of not being believed, fear of not, uh, of being judged as being different, intrinsically different, or uh, um, standing out compared to their peers around them and stuff. And um, again, I sort of get back into what you were saying, Caroline, I think one of the probably direct antidotes to all of those, to, to those bad, Ghoulies is um, those feelings of being trusting and open and stuff. And that's why it's all at the core of the kind of uh, ethos, I feel, as it's all kind of. Yeah, I've kind of lost where I was going with that a little bit. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Trusting this being the helping us out with all of this. Um, the, the kind of problems that voice hearers face when it, it comes to either talking about the experiences to begin with. Or continuing to talk about them because there's lots of different judgment that those people can, you know. Yeah. I like how kind of messy it is. Um, I know that you know you you wanted to get a message out there. Um, I, but yeah, I think you, you need the darkness for the for the light. Um, but yeah, I think that there are multiple truths um, and. That's one of the things that the, the network means to me is that um, there are many different narratives. Um, there are many different kind of paths to uh, what we call recovery or um, the Hearing Voices Network being a really, really kind of good one. But it's, it's not the only narrative. And I think we've got space for that. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to tell people the, the way forward, but we're going to hold a space for um, be it different truths, be it kind of that someone had a really traumatic childhood or that it is spiritual or both. So like, yeah, and it's not and or, well, it's not or, it's, it's both and. And I think that that is um, kind of a philosophy that I think is central to, to this way of working, which I love. Yeah, I, I love that, that the, 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 the in a way, when we talk about what is the narrative or what is the narrative of the narratives, then we can kind of get a bit, a bit kind of tangled up um, in, in, in what our framework is. But if we switch to thinking about space making, um, that seems like such a powerful way and also a way of kind of maybe or a way of centering bodies as well, um, rather than thinking about whether any you know what what is what, what what is allowed or not allowed to be said it's kind of beginning with space that i really that really resonates with me yeah i feel like um in the us you know there it may be like a less secular culture there's more comfort with spiritual frameworks i think in our spaces but i do notice and this is something we talk about maybe breaking down is there sort of this misconception that if it's a difficult experience, then it has to be trauma, not spiritual? 
or even this idea that trauma model and spirituality framework, that these are two separate things, um, at least in my own tradition, they're actually very like interwoven. Collective trauma can have a spiritual significance. There's a lot of voice hearers um, in my tradition that their experiences were spiritual in nature, but what they saw was effing terrifying and loud and God said, kill your son. And then no, wait, that's not what I meant. Like that's one of our central narratives around voice hearing. Like when you hear a voice that, you know, is spiritual telling you to end something, like maybe it's a metaphor. Um, so yeah, I love that we kind of, you know, in some spaces, there's these very separate modalities and frameworks that never connect. But, you know, in HBN, they're really woven together. And um, there are groups are wide enough for that complexity. Um, you know, it wasn't something that we directly addressed in the film, but we hope to at least kind of like plant the seeds for those um, discussion that, yeah, like a spiritual framework doesn't just look like this white light experience um, for everyone. Um, and, you know, one of the things I say a lot in training because our charter in HBN USA says, no assumption of illness is is in our charter but one of the things i say a lot is no assumption of illness does not mean no assumption of struggle so a lot of times in my culture that's very medicalized it's like oh if there's a problem there's a pill for it um which people spoke to in the movie um or i've heard i've been criticized of like romanticizing um you know HBN romanticizes um, voices, but um, you know, if if romance is honoring the darkness and the light, I'll take it, I guess, because that's what we're trying um, to do. So, I suppose, kind of answering. Um, kind of well what what I what I thought of when I was thinking about like the trauma narrative and I, I think that the spaces in England do allow for complexity um but I do a lot of training of um of therapists and psychiatrists well they are not, not massively uh not not many psychiatrists but you, you do get um one in a group kind of thing and it seems as if the trauma narrative is perhaps kind of taking over as the, 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 the one um, kind of maybe taking over from the, the biomedical model um, in in some of the um, with, with a lot of the people that I meet, they're kind of like, OK, so we're going to be trauma focused now. And, you know, that's really, really good. Um, but yet so many people don't understand their experiences as traumatic. Potentially they'll go on to do that. I don't know. So this is my kind of like my therapy hat kind of like struggling with my HVN hat. Like I'm so like the therapist part of me wants to be like trauma, trauma, but the, the hearing voices group hat is like, it might not be, um, you know, there are so many, so many stories, so many narratives, so many, so many options. And um, yeah, I think in the UK at the moment, we can be pushing the trauma narrative quite firmly which I think crowds out other, um, other truths. In my experience and, and what I have been, been seeing is that the trauma narrative, it has been enabling people to ask that what has happened. Uh, so for me, it has had that good side of it. Uh, but yes, I agree, it's kind of a, we need to have some kind of definitions, it seems to be so, so that things have some kind of format or uh, sense-making process of it, yeah. Hmm. I, 
Yeah, I, 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 I agree with all of that. And I, I wonder about, um, so uh, the trauma, the language of trauma seems it's, it's very broad. And um, in a way, it's a kind of unbound lexicon, like, because we can talk about collective trauma, for example, like you mentioned, Caroline, and that seems super important. And also as a way to bring in kind of more structural kind of analysis of kind of power analysis into kind of groups or demographics or peoples that have been collectively traumatized or continue to be in certain ways. Um, and then we talk about intergenerational trauma um, as well. But I, I wonder actually whether it's not really a shift um, or we, we, we must be cautious that it's about it, it's calling it a shift from a biomedical to a trauma model because biomedicine is so interested in trauma <laughs> now. And so we can totally see the way in which kind of we talk about people will talk about intergenerational trauma, for example, in terms of the epigenetics of and the genetic, you know, and so, so that can still continue. And so that's a kind of a worry that, I, that or, or that's a, an issue. Yeah, yeah trauma-informed is becoming a buzzword um, here. Um, honestly, what I like to talk about more is just context-informed. So we're, we're going from just looking at internal biology to seeing a person in their wider context. And I find that gives a bit more room for the cultural the spiritual generational factors. Um, I mean, then you just kind of have to under explain what context means, but it just gives you that much more space, I think. Hey, so I could actually go, I was like zoning and I was going in with my own thoughts on all this and going, what do I think about this? And I could have listened to you guys carry on with this, this line of thinking, but I'm aware of the ever growing list of questions. Um, one thing I just say is, is with my HVN chair hat on, certainly within England, um, our biggest thing is that we're a no model um, organization in that the important thing isn't the framework that someone brings. I think Caroline might've said it in the, the movie, it's just working with where people are at and what makes sense to them, be it a biomedical understanding, a social, because usually those are together, like bio, social are together. So is spiritual, social and bio can be together. It's just that in our, well, certainly my experiences within services, I didn't have the choice to choose. I didn't have the power to choose. Whereas in these, by creating these spaces, I've been able to, explore and connect from a position of no trust to developing some trust and that's helped me find a way of understanding them that's fluid and that works for me so yeah trauma is one of the many models and approaches but i wouldn't even say it's mine that's just part of a very multi-layered vibe so slightly worried about how we're going to get to these questions I can see already that some of them are very uh, technical. So Andrew has asked about looking at starting to do a hearing voices group in the States. I know Caroline is involved in training people to do that. So what I suggest for the technical ones. We... Email me, Andrew, we'll talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some easy ones that what I can do is just answer them and then send those answers around to everybody. Um, so everyone has it, not just Andrew. <laughs> um, so what we'll do is we'll go through a couple of the written ones and then get a few of the hand raises as well. If you still want to have your hand raised, come into the room, remember press hand raise and we'll invite your audio or your video in. So we have Wolfgang. Um, he said, concerning the alternatives to treatment of voice hearers, how do you feel about involuntary treatment? Does anyone particularly have a thought about that? I'm guessing you'd mean that there's lots of alternatives now, so involuntary treatment? My experience is it involuntary treatment can actually just end up replicating a lot of the trauma um, that people have, that has made people struggle um to begin with um there's a lot of wonderful healing practices out there 
But when you add force to it, it kind of turns into something else. And I think we understand this like in our lives, like, you know, sometimes like if, like if we choose to touch someone and give them a big hug, it might feel like warm and good. But if someone like comes up and like, you know, grabs me, um, it changes into something else. So um, in the US, it's really important that our groups um, that folks choose um, to be a part of that. And, you know, it sometimes it gets complicated with online. Um, I've had some people get coerced um, into attending online groups, um, which we address when it happens where someone else gets the login and then um, someone is sitting there not really wanting to participate. But we've we've put some uh, we've put some procedures in in place that that doesn't happen um, as much as it used to. Um, but those are my thoughts on involuntary. Anyone else? Good. Oh, Jess. Um, I think, as Caroline said, there are, um, it's, it's, well, sh I'm just going to say it's not ideal. It's really not ideal. And I think that that's one of the reasons that um, Hearing Voices groups work so well is because um, they're voluntary, completely voluntary. However, um, as the sister of somebody who is um, involuntary incarcerated right now. It's really, really tough. I don't think there is a simple answer to this. I, th I don't think that um, enough alternatives exist currently. I know that when um, me or my family are really, really worried about my brother and worried for his safety, it's kind of like a, you know, I don't know. It's just a really, really difficult space to, for me for me to be in. You know, I don't think he's safe in hospital. I don't think he's safe out of hospital. Um, crap. And yes, I totally agree um, that it's not an, an easy question to, to answer to, um, but I'm thinking also about the process of how we work with the whole network um, that is there so that people wouldn't need to go to hospital uh, if that is something that they don't want to do. Uh, and I'm thinking about the, the resources that there are and how the continuity of the care when we are talking about the systems of care and how that is crucial for me, at least in my experiences. Um, yeah, many things. Can I say one more thing, sorry. Yes. Uh, really quickly. So one, a couple of things we've done is, you know, those of us that bring groups into prisons and forensic units as I've done, what that can do is you can create a bubble of voluntary sort of community interaction within the involuntary space. So there's that HVN group in there, which people can choose to attend, even if they're not choosing to be in that hospital. Second thing is HVN support groups for parents. We've developed separate groups for family members, because a lot of times, you know, family members are have no one to get like their own support from. And that's when they sort of turn to, you know, the police um, a lot in our country. So, you know, what we've needed is more initiatives for them so they can talk about their own feelings. Okay, I'm gonna um, move on to another question just so we get a few in again, these are all big. There's one that really struck me on the Q&A, um, and this is, is there always a message behind voices for the voice hearer? Um, just looking further onto some of the comments that have been under it, I'm kind of thinking about people watching this who think, well, do I, I don't, I've gone past that now, the pills work, or I don't hear voices anymore, do we need to go looking for what the meaning is? Should I look? Is there a meaning? How do I know? 
it's a common question. What, what do you guys think? Has anyone got a thought? Um, as someone who hears voices, I can speak from my own experience and say that some of them do and some of them don't for me. So you could, there definitely, there definitely couldn't be a one size fits all kind of like thing for that, I suppose. I guess if we we're talking about the movement overall, the idea is that we don't, we, we want to not pathologize the experience of voices and open ourselves to their being meaning. But also sometimes I hear a voice that kind of just repeats back to me exactly what I'm doing. And it happens generally when I'm like doing the same thing again and again for quite a period of time. Like, does that have a deeper meaning? Maybe. Or maybe it's just like, a, like an echo, if you know what I mean. It doesn't, it's, um, so I suppose frustratingly, my answer would be yes and no. <laughs> Any other? I'll be brief again. Um, sometimes when I'm hearing a voice, what it means is just I'm super stressed. Like, or maybe I haven't been able to discern like it's, exact meaning or the voice is really repetitive. So I guess for me, what I'll say, I've, I've heard like transcendent voices about like, that involved metaphors about forests and seeds. And then sometimes I just hear a guy yelling at me and what it means is I'm kind of freaked out and I need to do something to relax. Um, and, you know, that's a message too. Is it the most profound? Will people write books about it? Maybe not, but it's important information for me to have. Anyone else? I think there's a, as, as, as a non-voice hero, except the one time when my best friend died and he came to say goodbye to me, but that's another story. But as, as a non Voice here. I, I often sort of try and understand voices as very similar to dreams, or at least I use that analogy to try and normalize it. So it's okay to have all these weird experiences when we're asleep, but it's not okay if you do it when you're awake. So in terms of dreams, there are some dreams that the meaning is really obvious. Um, some dreams that, yeah, we think we might be able to figure it out, but I've got to get to work now. And some that are just totally banal and just sort of about what you had to eat last night. Um, and from listening to lots and lots of people who hear voices, it's, I think it's probably similar to that. I, I don't know. Um, that's just my two penny worth. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Um, and we're going to experiment now because we've got two people that would like to come on and, um, and join us. What we'll do is go to another question and then we'll go to another person and we'll be getting there. At least we know the, the talking works, which is, is brilliant. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Ah, it's back on the meaning idea actually, uh, from Lorna. What influences the meaning attached to hearing voices, attitudes of friends and family, cultural, religious beliefs, media, mental health, professional views? You know, what, what, what's in the picture? Any thoughts on that? All of the above, I would say. Yeah, and, and many more in, from what I've seen and what. Yeah, that's what I think, but yeah. Everything influences mine. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, like even like where I am in my cycle, like my hormones, I'll talk about it. <laughs> it influenced my voices. Um, you know, uh, things I watched on Netflix, you know, I'll have voices talk about shows. Um, so I would be kind of hard pressed in my life personally, to think of things that don't like influence it or haven't influenced it, uh, the voices I hear at some point. Yeah, just as a slight aside, I did some research with some young adolescents that heard voices. And what was amazing is those that had not really heard much of the medical stuff, um, had maybe got superheroes and characters. 
they had some really cool ideas about what it was to hear voices. It wasn't hearing voices, it was a superpower. And it was only when they started to realize it would result in bullying and getting kind of ostracized that it became something different. It became a big deal. Um, again, that really struck home to me how important context is and the media. Okay, so we've got Grace um, who has got her hand up, I think. Again, if you just want to say hello, that's fine. We've got about five minutes left, so I'm afraid it's gonna to have to be one of those shorter ones, but I'm gonna invite you to talk now. So if you switch your microphone on. Hello, is that Grace? Yep, so am I on? Yeah, yeah, you're on, welcome. Thank you. Um, it's hard to be short because mm -hmm. um, basically um, we can't even begin to it, it's my son i'm you know i have I, I have a history of poly drugging for depression and crap that i'm dealing with that i'm trying to get off but i'm i'm here for my son which he doesn't like me to talk about him but i don't know what to do because for five years he's had nothing but abuse and trauma and from the system there has been no help for him none there's been abuse there's been forced hospitalizations there's been forced drugging forced drugging to the point where i saw him dying i wasn't even supposed to be seeing him i got talked my way in and it was gruesome what i saw foaming out of his mouth rigid body i mean i, I could get into four but i said what is going on and they said you have to leave i said no my son can't even breathe he needs help. Finally, they, I had to argue and argue and argue. And finally, they had to see, he had, they had to rush him to CVICU. I have the record to say he was in respiratory distress. He had, his muscles were dying off, some big long word, rhabdomyolysis or whatever. His kidneys were getting clogged from dead mus muscle tissue. Um, his vital organs were shutting down. He was dying. And they left him in isolation all day, dying because they overdosed him. And that is just the worst of what he suffered. He suffered more than that before this. And then after that, they intimidated me. I'm the crazy mother. And they put him back in psych, refused visitations, and put him on the floor, kicking him and beating him in the head. He can't see. He has no peripheral vision since then. Putting him in restraints hours and hours every day, injecting him constantly and writing up more and more labels to cover up what they did to him. And, and I don't know what to do anymore. We live in constant fear of the system. I live in fear for him more than he does because he's like drugged up and tranquilized and he thinks everything's gonna be okay and he's just gonna quit his drugs and everything's gonna be okay. I am scared because I know how they got him into the hospital. They lied about him and so I, I'm so scared. I, like ever since he's been home, I had to fight for three months to get him home. Mm -hmm. Three three months, I had to fight for his life and then I had to fight to stop them from sticking him away in a state mental hospital. And now we, we live in isolation since October of 2018 and any appointment he goes to, I sit there with him so that nobody can lie about him because that's what they did. And they, they, they made a mistake, so they tried to get rid of their problem. And so now that's a scary thing. And everyone in Tampa, Florida is a report mandated reporter. And I've been told that myself. They said, be careful what you say. So I can't even go to therapy because we're not free to talk because they say I'm a mandated reporter. So I can't mm -hmm. share. So you end up it's getting like silence. you look wrong and you're thrown in the hospital. It sounds like I don't know I'm just having this. I'm very desperate. Yeah, no, I can really hear that. And I'm aware that what I'm doing is effectively silencing you because the crapness of it is it's towards the end. And I know that people will be leaving soon and I'm kind of balancing all these things. I guess what I can say to you um, is obviously HVN USA are amazing. Caroline is amazing also. But we've been. Hi, Grace. Hey. Um, we're not going to be able to solve that, are we? 
just here, just now. It's more like just hearing it. And some people may have thoughts. Um, people that are attending now may know people in that area, may have some ideas, certainly it's the States, which is very different to the UK. Um, what I'd invite people to do is if you do have an answer, not an answer like fix it, but an idea, a suggestion, a story, a contact, get in touch with us at info at hearing minus voices.org and we'll pass it along and I'll have a think of some resources too, because it sounds like you're just feeling desperate, alone and overwhelmed. Um, I hate that we're not able to give something that's, yeah, it just sounds, oh, can I swear? Yeah, shit. Beyond yeah, shit. the last training I did was in Florida and I, as an American, I just want to validate, um, you know, the reality of how tough things are down there, how, um, you know, what's supposed to be support often looks like law enforcement, even though someone has broken no law, sometimes even worse, uh, the treatment people get than you would if you'd broken a law. Um, and I definitely can't fix it, but I can send solidarity and, you know, um, we have we have online versions of our family member support group that's attended by many Floridians and some other um, online platforms of support that I'm happy to share with people. Thank you. Um, what I'm sort of I mean I hate being the chair. It sucks. I like being the panelist. It's much more fun. Yeah. I guess where I'm at now is this wrapping up of of this this yeah this day this evening. What where are we? I don't know. We're all in different time zones. Um, I mean, first, in case people leave sooner rather than later, what we're going to do is I'll have a look at all of the questions and I will try and try some thoughts and or resources and then send it around to everybody. So there's, there's at least something quite concrete that's come from today. Um, the other thing I wanted to signpost people to was the um, HVN fund. We're going to launch our online forum um, to tomorrow actually um, so I'm going to put some links on your chat thing in case it's of use if you want to copy them down it includes the fundraising but also how to find a group in America or England um, and also the details of our online forum that you can get for support so people like yourself Grace that are really desperate you're welcome to join the family section and, and connect with people there it doesn't have to be the end of the conversation um, well, we've got some people here, so I, I hope that you guys will bear with us just for a few minutes extra. I'd love to hear just a couple of last words from each of the panellists, um, just because it feels quite nice to have a little closing ritual. And it also gives you time on the side, even though you're probably going to be feeling this need to help Grace, and I feel that need massively. But uh, I think I want to honour that need, um, but also honour that you guys have been part of this and you might want to say goodbye to each other or say how it was for you. So feel free to use the chat area to do that as well. There's not an expectation of fixing or even, yeah, it's just not possible in this moment. So I'll leave it to the panel just to decide who speaks when. We're going to do this beautiful thing you've been doing, sharing space and yeah, just a few words. Thank you so much, everybody. I have been learning a lot during this evening in this conversation and uh, yes, look forward to the next ones. Um, it was, um, yeah, thanks to everyone who uh, attended and the other panelists and the people who organized it and stuff like Ray and Kiko, everyone. So thanks to them. And uh, it's always really lovely to hear from the people who are involved and stuff really emotional and i guess i just say that uh fortunately hope isn't a finite resource so we've all got lots of hope and love to share around and stuff i know we're all feeling that especially you know hearing from grace and stuff we all are feeling those lovely vibes especially right now with um the covid stuff as well it's extra relevant all that so yeah
Okay, I'll go. I'll go next, and I'll be brief. I've, I've been involved in this struggle, if that's the right word, to get, to get mental health services to just to listen to human beings. It shouldn't be so difficult for a long, long time. So my my cliched and oft repeated sort of summary of it all is like it's a very, very hard struggle, but you sure meet the best people. So thank you for letting me be part of um, this evening. Thanks. Yeah, could, could, can I jump in and, and second that? Uh, that's lovely. Uh, thank you all, and and thank 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 you for for running the show, uh, Ray. Um, I love the idea that that hope is is not a finite resource. That's that's yeah, that's good. And um, yeah, I, I'm so so excited that this is happening and that these are conversations to be continued, as you said, Mia. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, I just um, want to say thank you for um, you know the, the participants and the panel and Ray for organising it. I've really enjoyed enjoyed being part of it. Um, and yeah, it as dark as it is, kind of bearing witness to people being really really stuck in the system. Um, this this movement is one that kind of sustain some hope and um, yeah, makes that darkness for me a lot easier to be with. Um, and I hope that you you find some kind of solidarity, Grace, and it, they won't take it away. Um, but yeah, I can only say what it, what's made it more bearable for me. I know for me, you know, 20 years ago when I was living in my parents' house um, thinking that I wasn't going to make it like another day, um, just surrounded by, you know, voices telling me that I was dirty and that I should die. Like, I could never have imagined that here I would be. Um, sharing a movie kind of about that with people like across the world and that they actually care um, and relate to it. Um, I never in my wildest dreams um, could have guessed that. So I'm super grateful to everyone who organized. And yeah, I just appreciate that we're not sugarcoating that things are hard. <laughs> They're hard right now. Um, it's difficult, um, but, you know, it sounds like a lot of us have dealt with isolation before, um, have dealt with loss and grief before. So I'm excited that we're more connected so that we can support each other and share the wisdom about how we're going to get through this together. I get kind of lost now because I get so caught up in who's speaking. I'm not sure if someone hasn't spoken who wants to. I'll just share one of my thoughts then. Um, oh, I feel really teary, actually. I hadn't realised how much I'd missed this space until we had it. And now I'm really grateful to everyone that's come. It's not just those in the physical space and those who joined us with their voices, so Laurie and Grace, um, but also uh, just looking at the comments. It's been really amazing. I think we're going to think about doing a few more of these, not, maybe a, a music one where we look at voices in music um, or film or just some more creative things while we're in this horrible COVID thing. We've bought a month's subscription to Zoom webinar, so we might as well make the most of it. Um, thank you so much guys um then i guess all that is for me oh there was one thing that came to me while you were speaking trust we place a lot of emphasis on trust but the big thing for me was learning to be okay with not trusting other people there was no reason i had to trust anyone and so one of my breakthroughs in my own journey came and there was many little breakthroughs was when someone told me that it was very right i didn't trust them 
and thought that they were going to kill me because I had no reason to trust them because loads of people in my life have hurt me within and out of the system. So actually being able not to trust, but being able to trust enough to sit in the same room with some security precautions um, so I could get out if she tried to attack me. Um, this was a therapist I thought might attack me. That was enough. And so, yeah, trust isn't an easy thing. And if you're watching this going, I don't have trust or my family member doesn't have trust. Yeah, good enough. As much as we can get. And just validating that trust is bloody difficult. Thank you so much to everyone. I'll just allow you all to say your goodbyes now. And we'll just hang around for a second as you say your goodbyes. And to leave the meeting, um, you just... Um, leave meeting there should be a little button somewhere and then after a couple of minutes I'll close the meeting I just don't want to chill out terribly um, so thank you and good night we should play some music right now shouldn't we should we continuously wave until people leave bye, bye. Um...